The following interview was conducted with Faith Wayne Pearson for the Purdue University Oral History Project. It took place on June 15, 2011 in West Lafayette, Indiana. The interviewer is Stephanie Schmitz and with her is Katie Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Uh -huh. So can you tell us a little bit about growing up in West Lafayette and um, like your upbringing and your siblings and, and where you went to school? Uh-huh. Um, I came to West Lafayette into the second grade. I was in first grade in Boswell. And my father wanted to be, he was not on education, he wanted to be sure that he got my brother and, and me to uh, some school and produce an it looked like a pretty good school. Uh, so he took a job as a coach and math teacher in West Lafayette, Indiana. And um, let's see, that was, uh, I had to stop and think what the year was. Uh, I was born in 21 and I was six years old when I went into second grade, so it was 1927 about mm -hmm. that we went there. And uh, in my book I talk about them dropped me off at the school and telling me to walk home. And that, yeah, I remember that. That was, was kind of interesting. Anyway, um, my brother was two and a half years older than I was, and he went to Purdue, of course, first. And then I, I came along after him, and I was always Faith Wayne's sister. I mean, <laughs> J.C. Wayne's sister. Uh -huh. And then he was, he was going to sign up for the air uh, for tr training and I said where are you going and he, he said he was going to go that and I said I'll come along is that all right and he said sure if I wanted to waste my time because it wouldn't take girls and I got in and he didn't so that's when I started my flight training and that was 1940 I came to Purdue in 1939 and uh, went into a course called the special science course for college women that Elliot had started, Dr. Elliot, to start a uh, uh, science school. And we were called the guinea pigs, and uh, we had Dr. Gilbreth as our teacher. And, and, but he, our, you know, our, our correspondent for the course, our teachers were Dr. Boyd, who was working on the atom bomb at the time. I didn't know it as oh our physics teacher. And Dr. Lanzos was our math teacher, and he worked for Einstein for several years before he came to Purdue. And of course, they had hired Amelia, I think at 19, yeah, uh, when you get this, if you, if you want this me to send you my copy of this thing, I will. I want to be sure I get it to you. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, it's too big for me to make a copy of. Yeah. And, um, the others you can keep. I, I copied them all, but I sent you the original yellow paper. Mm -hmm. Thought this would be good. And um, can you talk about having Dr. Gilbreth as a teacher? What was she like? Wonderful. She's just a real nice gal. It was after he had died, of course, and um, Purdue had hired her, sort of like they did Amelia, for publicity purposes, and um, because you know there are a lot of good reasons for. Purdue to have them associated, mm -hmm. and we had a, a, a meeting with each of our teachers and Dr. Gilbreth every week, so we got to know her pretty well. And she was, of course, she was older, maybe 60, 65 in that range, so uh, she had white hair, and she was just very delightful to talk to. Oh. And our teachers were really amazing. Dr. Lanzos was writing the new math book while he was teaching us. And he had a, he had a gal that wasn't any recording equipment. The gal in the back taking down everything he said, and that's sort of how the book got written. Oh, wow. Well. And uh, let me see, they didn't have radios and airplanes at that time, but one of the, uh, one of the air shows, the fellow who was demonstrating had had a radio in a car, which we could all surround and listen to, and he was talking from the airplane to the radio in the car. So uh, that was like 
1930. That was before I went to school, 1937, about. Hmm. Uh, but they didn't have any any radios in the planes when I first learned. Unbelievable. And speaking of airplanes, now when you were in high school, Amelia Earhart was working at Purdue. Right. And can you talk about your attending her lectures? Uh, how, it's just one lecture that I went to. Uh, most of them were for the college kids. Remember, I was I was started in um, high school. Mm -hmm. 1935 and graduated in 39, started at Purdue in 39 at 17, and graduated in 42, so mm -hmm. that's the timing. So this was like three, I think I was a junior, a uh, sophomore maybe, so it was the 36, 37 uh -huh. that uh, I went to one of her lectures. What did she talk about, do you remember? Uh, she, she was just... Um, it's, it's a hard thing for me to remember. Maybe if I look at the at what this this thing is that I wrote, it says more about what she said. Huh. Um, Coed here, famous flyer. My flight added nothing to aviation, stated Amelia noted a trip to the co-eds assembled at the activities banquet held at Memorial Union Ballroom Tuesday evening. In the light of her own experiences, Ms. Earhart developed her topic, Activities for Women After College. You probably had that article mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So you can read that. But I, I don't remember other than she was, you know, she was nice. She was, um, you know, she was, was an inspiration to everybody that went there. Uh, I, of course, felt I was more uh, inspired by my father and my mom than, and than I thought of as, as Amelia, except that she was inspiring. I was very interested in aviation. I went to all those air shows and uh, was a absolutely captivated. And the minute I managed to get into that course, which I'd never even thought about doing, except the day that I went, um, it it just was just my life until I couldn't do it anymore. Oh my goodness! War. Can you talk about some of those air shows that you attended? Did you did you do that during high school as well? Or uh, yes, I was in high school. That's that's when I went when I remember the air shows. They went on what I say, nineteen thirty four to um, uh huh. You know, till, till, till they the were war. still going on. Purdue was one of the first airports, you know, university airports in uh -huh. the country. And a lot of things happened through Purdue. Uh, just one of those things. That, that's, that's where all the action was. They were building another runway. In my papers, I, I read a lot of this stuff, building another runway one of the years while I was in high school. And, uh, you know, I, I, they did all kinds of stunts. They had women walking on wings. They had, oh. you know, flying upside down, right close to the ground, all that kind of stuff, which I was thrilled at. And members, members of the community were welcome to go to those air shows. Oh yes, I don't think they even charged a park. Wow, nice. I, you know, it was uh, just all there at the at the. You've been there, haven't you? Yes, yes. Uh, there where the trains went through. Uh -huh. uh, they parked from there over to the the field. And, of course, the field was just the, the first field, the one with the old uh, tower and stuff like that. There wasn't the other field that they developed later. So, but there was plenty of room for people to stand around. I don't even know the, if there was a fence can't remember hmm. if it was a fence or not. But you knew you better stand in a certain place because they, they were doing the stunts right in front of you. Wow. It was amazing. And, Loved it. And, um, so, and what was the organization that you got into? What was that called that your brother didn't get into? Special, oh, CAA, Civil Aeronautics oh, okay, Authority. Okay, okay. They started it in 1939, which was the year before I went to Purdue, or the, the summer before I went to Purdue. And uh, this was the second session 
And as I read these articles about it, it doesn't say anything about the girls. It only talks about fellows. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's what my brother said when I read the article. I said, it doesn't say you had to be a boy. And he said, well, they wouldn't date girls. And so I was, I was astounded I got in. And you, so at the time, you were probably the only girl in that group then, right? Two. Oh. There were two. The other gal washed out. She, huh. was, she was lost in her cross country. She came down trying to look at the, at the uh, bar, bar, writing on a barn, and she landed in the haystack. Oh, dear. It wasn't very good for the plane, but she walked away from it. That's good. Yep. And um, so I was the only girl that, that uh, you know, got a, my pilot's license. And then, and that must have impacted how you, chain, you, you, you chose your major then, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, very much so. Uh, I took, you know, the, the ground school, a lot of that, stuff in the meteorology was, was all really in the aeronautical school, uh, in the engineering school. They didn't have an aeronautical, they had an aeronautical degree. My, my brother graduated in the aeronautical engineering, mm -hmm. but that degree went into the Air Force. He never flew, at, you know, he flew, but not for the, for the Army. So, uh, and you did aviation technology, was that your major? Uh, well, I don't think uh, I don't think it was my major. I think it was a minor. Okay. I graduated in the science school. Well, I graduated in three years, you know. But I had enough engineering degree, uh, engineering courses, because when I got a chance to pick my courses, I picked engineering. Uh, the first two years of the of this special science group had these special teachers, mm -hmm. and they were teachers who who taught graduate students, not undergraduate like we were. Okay. So it was kind of hard for them to deal with us. <laughs> so you were mechanical engineering? I Yes, I okay. believe that's what, what it was, mechanical, yeah. And as the guinea pigs, were you, did you feel like, um, did they give you any different treatment than they did the male students, or...? Well, these were all women. There were 40 girls uh -huh. who went through this course, and we were called guinea pigs. We were, we were special, uh -huh. always special. And, of course, we had the special teachers. We had to meet with the teachers and Dr. Gilbreth every week. I see. Um, and so, but, but we got to take on the side. I got, I got uh, let's see, nine credits from going from high school there because the, the high school had the freshman books and stuff that we had mm -hmm. in English and that kind of thing. So I got credits for that before I started. I was a president of Alpha Lambda Delta the freshman year, you know, that's the freshman honorary. Okay. Mostly because I knew a lot of the gals in the in the special science course. You, and you had to know a few people as, as a freshman to, to get that kind of thing. It was very nice. I didn't played for it. I didn't even know that they were going to vote for me, but they did. Huh. So it sounds like you had a really positive experience as being a woman back then getting oh, yeah. getting into oh, engineering. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I knew that women were, were not supposed to have as many things as men, but I, I never thought about me being second nature, you know, a second citizen. Ah, I see. And the boys didn't tease you or anything for being into engineering? Oh, no. I got, I got letters from them afterwards saying they never would have gotten <gasps> through the course if it hadn't been for me. Wow. You know, it's just a, I was very good at math. My, my father's a math teacher. Uh-huh. And so much of a teacher that I would, when I was in college, I took a course that, that, I, that was very hard. And I, so one night I asked him, would he help me with his problem? And he said, no, it's all your problem. His problem was he didn't know how to solve it himself. Wow. And so he thought about it all night, and I worked on it, and I got it. And in the morning he said, did you get that problem? And I said, yes. He had, he had solved it himself that night. Oh. It was really interesting. Huh. But he, he made sure that I knew I had responsibility to do all these things. And uh, I know that he treated me, he and my, my mother, of course, was partial to me 
my brother was a terrible tease. Yes. <laughs> so it, it was just a great environment to grow up in. And did you live did you live at home during college or did you live on yes. campus? Okay. I lived at home. I did join a, a sorority, Alpha Chi Omega. Uh huh. But I didn't ever live there. I see. The folks really couldn't afford that. Yeah. That's why my dad, you know, a teacher didn't make very much money back when I first started there. He was under two thousand dollars a year. Oh gosh. You know, yeah, times have changed. And then you got involved with the radio station then. Oh yeah, this is WBAA, one of the first radio stations in a university. And I, I tried out for that and so I did a lot of WBAA work. I was a, and I was on the debating squad. Mhm. And I worked in in the school bookstore. Wow, you were busy. Yes, I was busy. What did you do at WBAA? Oh, we announced and we had specials, we had special programs that we developed, you know, as as students. And then when, uh, you know, I, you know, I had to do it at a station is to be sure and be there to to talk to them every 15, 20 minutes or something like that, 15 minutes or half an hour. Uh -huh. So we had to, to be sure and know all the stuff. And I sign off, you know, this is Faith, Faith Wayne at WBAA, 5,000 watts, it went from 10 in the morning to 10 at night. And so I did a little spiel. I did. Wow. Every, everybody who ran the, you know, we we all took turns. It's that's twelve hours a day, every, every day. I don't know if we were on on Sunday or not. Hmm. I think so. And it must have been interesting to use that radio equipment back then and learn how to use it. Oh, no, I, I didn't do the equipment much. No. You push buttons, you know. The, but that's all. I, I didn't. See. I wasn't engineering. On the engineering side of a WBAA at all, I was in, I was on the engineering side of flying, you know, the uh -huh. planes. But the uh, mechanical, I was trying to get my license for fixing planes, and I worked on it quite a bit, but I never was able to complete the li license because I graduated so fast. Oh, and how come you did graduate so fast? Because of the war. Okay. I had planned to go to IU and get my my law degree and be a patent lawyer. Oh. And my father thought that was great. He liked any any more more education that he could get down as he would. Uh huh. But um, the war came along. It changed everybody's life. I mean, the the atmosphere uh, completely changed with the war. Uh, we were in the Midwest, so we didn't feel. So time I, um, I, I moved to, to New England, then I felt the effects of I see. There's somebody trying to dial in, but we'll ignore it. Okay. They'll get you after lunch. Um, so it was, it, it was when Pearl Har Harbor happened, you graduated shortly after? Well, Pearl Harbor was December 7, 19... Uh, I need to go back to the the date again. Forty one. Forty one, right? Okay. I didn't graduate till August of forty two. Okay. But I was a given license. I mean, everything just changed. The boys changed. You know, some had to go in right away. Some, of them, you know, signed up. Um, my brother was graduating in January of forty two. Forty two. In January of 42, yes. So he went right into the Air Corps and went on to, to Wright Field. He didn't fly, but he was in the Air Corps. In fact, he was in charge of the um, atom bomb testing oh. later on. We didn't know about the atom bomb, but we had the cyclotron there. That's what they were working. A lot of people there were working on the cyclotron. Hmm. So that was interesting, too. That was one of my side things I did. I did a, a class, I mean a course, that with this displaced this, this lady from Poland, I think she was, and she was had her doctorate and she was working on testing, I mean working with 
with that, um, with the, the radiation. I you see. give people pills, radioactive pills, to see where they dissolved. Mm -hmm. and it, by tracing it with the Geiger counter down their stomach. You can believe they do that kind of stuff. They, we didn't know. Yikes. In fact, my bro brother died from radiation for because they didn't know to keep this. Uh -huh. People that were sending off the bombs in a safe place. They turn your head. Yeah. It wasn't good, but we didn't know. And um, so you graduated and then got married? Yes, I graduated in August and got married in September because I was moving to New England. I didn't feel comfortable. I'd never been away from home, you know. I didn't feel comfortable going out there. And my, and my boyfriend, my, who was finally my husband, um, went to Hamilton Standard, and I, they came to interview, and I interviewed, and they gave me a job as an engineer. I see. So I was fairly happy with that, being able to do that. And um, were, were, were they hiring a lot of women engineers at the time because of the war? Or? Well, there weren't many women engineers around, you know. They were hiring women and calling them engineering aides. Oh. I was, I was classified as an analytical engineer. I see. And, and you got to use a lot of the knowledge that you... Well, knowing how to run the, the slide rule it was the most important piece of knowledge I had. Uh -huh. And then I had a good math background. You know, whenever you go into a job, it's a matter of applying yourself to the job. And they were very happy with my performance uh, because I was accurate. And what we were doing was running um, tests using slide rules and, and charts to tell whether what kind of a propeller we should be designing. And we designed this, the paddle blade and uh, the reversing prop when I was there off and on. Hmm. And as a woman engineer, do you feel like you were treated equally to your male counterparts? I was treated equally at, at, in working. You know, I was an equal partner. There were one, two, three, three of us in the, in the head of the department. There were four of us in the department when I went. And I was as accurate as the other two were, and one of us had the, developed the uh, reversing, the, the d a double prop, Chuck Command, and had his own company until he was 85. He was president of that company. So they were smart guys. The other one was Les Trigg, who went to Republic and became a, um, I don't know what his position was, but he just, I went to Republic Aircraft, but when he left there, when he left there, that's where he went. And then uh, they they would use these engineering aides in the classes in the different things, but they were called engineering aides. And other than that, most everybody else that were women were secretaries. So mm -hmm. They the the men they were really nice to me in in the department and you know, even the other departments. Uh, in engineering there. They're all very courteous and always kidding and all that kind of good stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems like you had a pretty um, happening social life at the time, too. Well, we are the only, you know, the only ones in the, in the department who had a house that were our age, you know. Mm -hmm. So they all came to our house, too to bum around. I had never, I didn't do any drinking in college or nor that during that period of time, but they, they did a lot of drinking at our house and I sort of made, kept things going, you know, that kind of thing. The good hostess, yes. Yes, I was the good hostess and I was, I was married to Al for nine years before I divorced him. Uh-huh. And then right before you divorced him, did you, was it American Steel and Aluminum that you got a position? Yes. Yes. As assistant bookkeeper. Okay. So that's a whole change of pace then. Well, I still work just as hard, and, I, and I, in five years I was corporation secretary. Mm-hmm. And they were, let's see, I guess there were about 20 in the, in the office, and there were about 40 men in the warehouse. 
So that's the size of the place. What did what What does a corporate secretary do? She goes to, to the meetings. I was I was running. I was also office manager. Uh huh. But corporate corporation secretary is one that signs things and and is official. Okay. You know, she's on the board, I guess you'd call it. Okay. And then you got divorced and and had two kids on your hands. Right. <laughs> Can you talk about raising two children and um, working full time? Yes. Well, I got a full time job before I asked my husband for a divorce because I didn't want to take money from him. And this divorce, I settled divorce saying I just wanted half of what we'd saved, and most of what we had saved was because we had to move for different things, and I made a lot of money on the houses that that we bought and sold. Mm -hmm. And the house that I, before I divorced Al, um, I, he, he's still in the same house. Got, got married the next year, and they're, they're still living there. To this day. <laughs> yeah, she, she didn't like move. He, did, he didn't want to go move anyplace. So he said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to take the two kids and half of what we saved. And, and then I agreed to $50 a month for him to pay for the two kids. But I didn't take any furniture with me to speak up. I said, he said, what are you going to take? I said, well, I, have to, I need a refrigerator, I need a stove, and I need a washer. So I'm going to take those three. But I didn't take any furniture. So the kids and I picnicked on the floor. I oh, got around to my. making some tables and stuff like that. But I had the job, and uh, what I did was hire Hal was three, so I hired a lady to come stay with us, two or three in a row. And Lance, the older boy, didn't like somebody bossing him around, so he didn't like us having these ladies, so he wasn't very, con you know, congenial about the whole thing. Uh -huh. However, he's, he's, uh, he had to live with it until I got the job in New York. And when I moved there, Hal was seven and he was 11. And so I found a, a place that I could take them where they had only had three blocks to walk to school. It, and they had, it was, um, it was a famous person's house they bought with land around it right at the end of Whitestone Bridge. And um, so we were on the fifth floor in a, a very nice little apartment. Took half my salary to pay for that, but when they went, came back from school, they could go to the, the clubhouse and they had fellows here taking care of the kids, you know, who they could swim and they were a lifesaver there and had all that kind of stuff. I see. So it was, I, just, I just said that's the best thing. And what job drew you to New York? Um, the, the boss, the guy who owned American Steel, asked me to come. He'd, he'd lost his sec second-in-command and he asked me to come and fill that spot. And he was he he was not compatible with these kids. He had four kids, and his wife had died, and they each got a million dollars every time when she when she died. So they were not very congenial. So he didn't want to have them to have anything to do with his business. So the first day, I think this is in my book, I, they he asked me to call uh, Mr. Tripp from from um, Chase, Manhattan, up, and he said, I want this lady to have my power of attorney. And Mr. Tripp looked at him and looked at me, because I'm in my 30s, <coughs> early 30s, and said, have you known her long? But other than that, uh, I, ran the, I ran the offices. He lived at the Hotel Pierre, and he might come in the office once every couple months. He, he, was, not, he was not running the offices. I knew all the fellows in the other Companies. He owned several companies, one in Boston, one in uh, Baltimore, one in New Jersey. So there were a lot of companies he had, and, and the one in Hartford that I'd been working in. So that was my job, to make sure that I, went, I you know, got all their papers every week, and I made sure everything was running smoothly. I and, see. And how is the work culture there? 
in New York. Uh-huh, at that particular... In, I in had that a three-room suite on the 61st floor of Rockwell Center. Wow. So I, other than the, the fellows in the elevator knew me by name, and that's, I was always Faith, and everyone wanted to be Mrs. Anybody. Uh-huh. And you would ride to the basement and, and have lunch and ride back up. We didn't have any way to have somebody else answer the phone. So I had to be there, you know, many hours per day and not take very long for lunch. Kind of thing. It was just one of those things. It was a business day. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have anybody to work with. You know, I was in this three-room suite all by myself. And um, nobody had talked to Mr. Dillon unless his name was uh, Thomas J. Dillon, uh, unless they came through me. And the, the boys who ran the other companies weren't too happy about that, but that was the way it was. Hmm. And I traveled to the other companies and would go over their books and, and you know, make sure everything was going well. They were, they were older than I was, these guys running the companies. So it was kind of an interesting job. I bet at Rockefeller Center during that time too. What a place! Uh, well, it it was it was it was fabulous. It was just uh, I didn't have any friends, and the friends I had were Mr. Dillon's friends, and uh, they wanted to be sexy. <laughs> you know that's oh, what happens if you're 30 dear. years old and they're at they're 60. You know, uh -huh. 70 years old. But and so I had a little problem dodging that, but. Other than that, why? And it was lonesome. I signed. I went down to New York University and signed up for a law course, but they wouldn't let me take just one course. I had to take four years or something. Oh. And so I couldn't do that. Um, it was. It was. I had a lot to do, so I. I keep myself pretty busy. Uh huh. But it's hard to, to do a lot of things. Yeah. And um, but you ended up meeting a fella named Bob. Yes, I m had met him in Connecticut. Oh, okay. I knew his wife, and I, you know, they were married. I got a divorce, and I moved to New York. Now, Bob d divorced his wife along the way somewhere, and uh, he did a lot of traveling in his own company, Purse Pearson Company, and. Uh, he would come to New York every once in a while. My kids would go to Indiana in the summertime just to vacation with my folks. I'd, bo I'd drive them out and, and uh, drop them off. And so then Bob would come down and we'd, we'd date and, and go to the uh, theater. You know, mm -hmm. I really missed the theater when I left New York. We finally got married. Oh, let's see, I've been there three years. And I told Mr. Dillon about him. And he says, well, but this time Mr. Jones had a stroke, you know, and he couldn't, he couldn't, uh, he had speech aphasia. Oh. So we'd have to play charades at what he wanted to do. But I, by this time, I knew all his family that he corresponded with. And he was also president and chairman of the board of a Canadian company. And uh, so I knew all those people, too. And, of course, then the businesses in, in the United States. Uh, so... We would correspond to these different people. So I think I had a funny thing in there in the, in the book about how he wanted to tell me something and he couldn't figure out how to say it. Uh -huh. he, fi he finally said whiskey, and I said, the doctor said you could have a drink. Yeah, yes. <laughs> go, go, go. So that was my life, pretty wow. much. And I told him that when I married Bob, I had to move to West Lafayette. And that I couldn't be there every day, but he was afraid I was going to leave him because, you know, he couldn't go around making it somebody else. Uh, his, uh, his, you know, his second in command. Uh huh. So I said, no, I, I would come, but I could only come to New York twice a week. So he picked Tuesday and Friday for me to come. And that's what I did all the time until he died. Wow. And we sold the businesses and. So I got out of that. you traveled from Indiana to New York twice a week? No, he was in Connecticut. Okay, okay, Connecticut. No, the New kids York. went to Indiana to see my folks for a year in the summertime. Okay, okay. 
And um, and after he sold the business, then you worked with Cigna. Yes, I, I within a few weeks I went to work at Cigna to learn data processing because it was coming along, and I thought that was a thing to do. I stayed there five years. So data processing at the time that was working with computers. That, that's card systems or tape systems, that's all they had. They didn't have the kind where you could talk directly to the computer. Mm -hmm. You had to, you know, make transactions. And what they have is a main file on a, on a tape. Uh, what I worked with, I mean, but they, the card system worked too. They had two cards, the two things that they did, the card system and the tape systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was all that you could do. How did you how did you go about learning that kind of technology? Um, well, I was in training maybe for three weeks. We what we did was learn what how they did this, and then we did our own thing. And they the guy who was who was teaching you know this thing said nobody ever got it right the first time. It's very picky hmm. kind of thing to type these things and make sure everything is right. And I got them right the first time. Ah. That's just because my mind goes that way, you know. I have a, a, a math background, and that helps in a lot of ways in the kind of things I was doing. And it helps in data processing. It's just because of the logic. It's the math. It's the logic that helps you. I see. And I gave them five years because that's, I figured I, I owed it to them for teaching me the stuff. Uh -huh. And then, then I w built the house in, on the mountain, and then I went to work for uh, Weathersfield, Connecticut, in a, as a, uh, my title was information specialist. And can you tell us about some of your accomplishments there? Uh, well, yes, I, what, I, what I did was work with each of the departments. The town manager said, I was supposed to change how they did things so that they'd be more effective or more, you know, if, if they did a better job. And but uh, they wouldn't. He wouldn't tell them they had to do what I told them. I had to convince them it was the way to do it. And that was kind of interesting. I had a, a assessment professor or head of the department, and he was he was exactly like W. C. Fields to write to somebody put lemonade in my lemonade, you know, kind of thing. Hmm. You remember W.C. Fields? I mean, he's sort of behind you before your time, but I, he, was a, he was a funny guy in huh. the movies. And uh, this, this guy just didn't want to do anything I tried to convince him to do. I convinced him through his, his uh, girls that worked with him. I, I, they I didn't have titles. I was trying to think of what they call them. They aren't secretaries, but they were people who kept the records and assessment records. So I finally convinced him to do these things this way. And this young man from MIT came along and wanted to find a place. Well, it's, it's kind of a long story. I don't want to go into the details of how I got him, but it, it, we finally convinced the, town, the uh, council to let him write his programs, which is the first interaction with the computer, you know, first time you could use a CRT, cut a screen, and call up the computer and change something. Up to that point, you had to do go through this routine that we went through in uh, at, at, Mer at, at uh, CG, Connecticut General, and, uh, and, and still in Weathersfield, we had to have groups of towns that got together and, and got an IBM machine or an RCA machine tape system so that they could do their paperwork and everybody sort of um, typed this out on a card or, or something and, and used it to do their stuff. And it was very, very uh, impossible to manage, you know. Mm -hmm. So David came, and David Griffel, his name was, and he wrote all night, and I would test all day. We got a, we got a mini computer, they called them at that time, 
IBM and RCA had, had completely gotten away from this thing. They, they had a great business going. They didn't want something new coming along. So we wrote, I wrote a lot of things, and David needed somebody who was in this business to know how, how we should be writing this stuff. And uh, in six months, we had uh, the assessment and tax system converted, and in nine months, we had all the rest of the parts converted to admins, and these little CRTs like you look at your computer now, your little lap computer. Mm -hmm. But we were using CRTs, which were fairly big, a fairly good size. And then we had this huge computer that we had to pay $150,000 for uh, that we went into it by, by uh, electrical wires. And, uh, but it is a, a, a wonderful system in, in nine months. Uh, New, Newark, uh, New, Newport, New Rhode Island wanted the system, so my assistant and I went over in the morning, converted their tax and assessment system from an IBM tape system to admins. And they were so happy. And that they were all done in one day. And and how that that made the work more efficient then for the oh yes I mean you have a clerk to sit down like like you're you're used to this computer you can talk to things right mm -hmm. you can ask at it things and it tells you but there wasn't that this many computers came along and it was the only thing that could do that kind of thing well, David wrote this he was from MIT yet it was as a graduate as a and he's doing graduate work at MIT so. He was great, and then it spread. Everybody, public technology in Washington, started spreading the word, and so we got calls from everybody wanting us to come do this stuff. And after another year, I said to the town manager, I don't have time to do both things. I'm going to start a company, which I did. I incorporated, and then I had customers all along the West Coast. Um, I said, 22 clients in Connecticut, had 18 in Massachusetts, and five in Rhode Island, and then we went to South Carolina. Um, so it really Oak Park, expanded. Illinois, and uh, was that I was the guy I was. <laughs> I met the places. Was that company called Mis Misty? Is that what that Misty? That was my is? company. Oh, okay. Management Information Systems and Training Incorporated. That's what it stood for. I see. And how long How long did you do that? Well, I incorporated in 1978, and I sold the company in 88. I see. And then, and, that, and then you officially retired. I officially retired. I, I wanted my husband to retire. He had his own company, and he traveled all over the United States also. And... Uh, he, uh, he was in a, a, a partnership, and the older person in this partnership, was, was, it was Purse Pearson Company, was Purse, and he, what after he retired, he gave his, his uh, stock to his son. Um, he would still come back, and Bob would complain bitterly about him, just sitting there joking with people and keeping them from doing their work, you know, that kind of stuff. And so I said to Bob, he wanted to go back and go and work. You know, nobody likes really leaving their work. It's hard. Mm -hmm. But I convinced him that he was he was then um, 68. And I said, you never get to go any place. Well, we did a lot of things with our companies, but not any long-term travel and stuff if you don't sell your company. And I'll sell mine if you'll sell yours. So... He sold it to the boys, to George Purse's boys, and it worked out well. I see. And then in retirement, you had lots of fun? Oh, yeah, it was great. I mean, Bob got then got prostate cancer, and uh, he was operated on for that, and he never was really the same after that. It went to his bone, oh. and so he ended up... He died in 93, but he had five years, and we did an awful lot of traveling. I mean, he, we went to the 
Eastern world, and we took a lot of QE2 uh, trips, and we went to New, New Zealand and Australia and to China and to <clears throat> Bangkok. Well, you know, we did a lot of things while he was alive. And after, and, and around that time, you got your pilot's license again? Uh, when we retired, I said to Bob, I want to go back and get my license again. And, and I want to go back to Purdue. And he said, fine, I'll visit you weekends. Um, he wouldn't go up with me in a small plane. Oh. He, he, had, he was a big plane guy. He worked for Sperry, uh, gyroscope, you know, automatic pilot, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he'd flown with Donald Douglas and Howard Hughes and Boeing and all, all those big, big shots. He wasn't going to fly in a small plane that I flew. I always flew just small planes. So that's fine. I just said I'm going to go back and get my license. And so he would come back, come with me. I decided to buy a house in, in West Lafayette, which I did. And then he would come back with me, and then he'd fly home, and then he'd come back, and I'd fly home. You know, I only worked in the in the summertime to get my um, ground school again. That's what I had to do. The next year, then I took flying. I see. And um, and after he died, you went on a trip on the Concorde. Yes. Uh huh. No. I had, the, the week he died. I uh, I got a letter from Purdue saying around the world in the Concorde fifty thousand dollars, and that's a lot of money. But I, you know, at this point, I money wasn't as important to to me, you know, because it was very hard to lose a husband. I signed up for it anyway right away, and I said, well, I got a year to change my mind. You know, they you didn't they didn't have a penalty if you signed off. But by the time the year got up, I decided it was probably a good idea for me to go, and it was the most wonderful thing I ever did for myself. You know, I, I was able to operate by myself. I had my 68th birthday, or 72nd birthday, on the mountain in, in oh, Africa. My. And they had, you know, a band and a birthday cake and all that kind of good stuff. And then that's when I, on the trip from from uh, Paris to New York, I was sitting behind the captain, and he said, would you like to fly the plane, knowing that I had my pilot's license? So you have to be kidding. He says, no, and he wiggled his body out of the seat, and <gasps> the co-pilot uh, co was flying. Well, I think it was on automatic anyway. We are going Mach 2, and I wiggled my body in. I put my hands in the air and said, I promise not to touch anything, and he said, Put your hands on the wheel. Where's your camera? <laughs> and so I said, hey, guys, pass up my camera. Well, there are 90 of us that have been together for 23 days, you know, at all kinds of parties and stuff like that. So everybody can study, got, got to know each other. So that was my experience in the Concord. Oh, my goodness. It's a wonderful experience. So by that time, I could do most anything, I thought. <laughs> oh, my. And, and so now you've settled in Florida. Yeah, you know, we had, I had bought a place up the beach in 72, and then I gave it to my son, well, Bob, before he died, he said, why don't you give that to the boy, and I, I gave it to my son, so we, we still have it at the moment. It's right on the beach in Bonita Beach. Sounds like a, a nice spot. Uh-huh, and, and I built two more duplexes across the street, and then we lived in one of those, I mean, that we had kept one as our apartment, and when... Before Bob died, we lived there. We sold our house in Connecticut and lived there. So Florida's been our home since 1968. I see. And do you um, do you keep in touch with Purdue at all? Do you attend any Purdue events? I I used to. I had the house there in West Lafayette, and I had two granddaughters, three granddaughters that went to Purdue. And one of them, when she's getting her master's, she lived with me. I, I was right on the uh, Brentwood Drive, Bentwood, Bentwood Drive, I'm trying to think Brentwood or Bentwood, hmm. um, right on the 18th hole of the Purdue Golf Course. I see. Right by the uh, putter. I had 18, uh, half an acre there and a nice house. And 
I loved the house. I just ran out of people that I knew at Purdue. The kids all graduated, and I finally, I mean, this is after Bob died, of course, so they still had it. Mm -hmm. But I bought it when I went back to get my pilot's license. And I still miss that house. It was a beautiful house. Oh. And um, what what are your fondest memories of Purdue? Oh, many. Um, it was such a wonderful place to be and what an, what an ideal time in your life. And, of course, now I have a granddaughter uh, who's going to be a senior in the fall. She's working on a special project this summer at Purdue. Um, her name is uh, Roxanne Faith Croxall. Oh. And uh, she's, I think she got a scholarship to start. This is the fifth grandchild I've had graduate from Purdue and one son. So that's a lot of my family gone to Purdue. Mm -hmm. Lots of and graduations, I, I bet. Uh-huh, yes, and not, they're great. And of course, I, I loved being there when anybody was there, but they all, Lan had two sections of the family. Uh, Matt graduated uh, three years ago, yeah, three years ago, four years between Matt and Rox. And uh, the three older girls all graduated. And Matt hadn't come along yet, and nobody came to visit me in West Lafayette. They all wanted to come to Florida to visit, so I spent most of my time in Florida to the West Lafayette. And though I had a few friends, you know, I, I, I knew a lot of the older people at Purdue, the dean of women and, you know, people like that, but nobody to bum around with. Which dean of women did you know? Um, I had it on the tip of my tongue and then I lost it again. She was there for a long time. Uh, God, pardon me, pardon my <laughs> language. <laughs> I, I hate that I I, I I thought I'd been doing pretty well to remember a lot of things. No, it's been wonderful. Uh, uh, Dean, Dean, mm, she'd been there so long. Maybe Beverly Stone. Oh, be, no, after Stratton, that. Schleeman. Um, there's Dorothy Stratton or Helen yes, Schleeman. Yes, Dottie Stratton. Okay, so you were buddies. Yes, I and I I knew hers. She, and then she finally went to mm, that place everybody goes in West Lafayette. Yeah, um, I know what you anyway, speak of. Uh -huh. I had, you know, several friends there. But, you know, when you get to be almost 90, most of your good friends aren't, aren't around anymore. If you don't start making new ones, you're in bad shape. Exactly. And all my new friends are here, of course. <laughs> That's good. And uh, I plan to go back to Connecticut uh, this this summer, my my granddaughter, one of my granddaughters, is getting her doctorate, and she has some extra time, so she's gonna meet me in Philly and t and go on to Connecticut with me. I don't feel very comfortable about traveling unless somebody's meeting me at the airport. Yeah, you know? yeah. Afraid I wouldn't get around very well. Well, is there anything in the interview that we didn't ask that you were hoping we would? <laughs> trying to think, so I, t I talk so much whenever you ask me a question. Um, I had 40 trips. I'm, I'm working my way through writing up the trips, and I have nine written. Um, many besides, I took a freighter trip to South America. Um, I, I took, we took the, I took my, uh, we took the kids, uh, all, of, all the children that we had to the Caribbean when Bob was alive, and then I took them to Alaska when I was 85. And I wanted to take them someplace, I'm 90, but you know, they've got kids and they can't leave, but it's seven days and all that kind of stuff. So it was hard to find a place that anybody could go, and now the count is up to 23. <laughs> wow. That's a lot of, you know, A lot of hotel money. rooms. <laughs> a lot of money. Well, I would go on a cruise is what I would thing to do, but they're all going to come down here, and uh, most of the family in August, and then uh, Chrissy, was, I mean, she's my granddaughter, is planning to uh, set up another one in October on my birthday. That sounds like fun. 
Yeah, but probably down here because it's the easiest place for people to get to, and I have the more, most apartments or the places to stay. I have four bedrooms and three and a half baths here, and I have uh, two apartments, three, four apartments there at the beach. So. And um, and then you you're working on a book about your travels. Yes. So we'll right. we'll be staying tuned for that one. Okay. Well, I'm, I hope to stay on it. I was doing pretty well until I, I broke my back this last time, and I just haven't been able to concentrate for the length of time it takes to to write one up. But I'm I'm now getting a lot better, and I'm my posture is the only thing I'm worried about. Okay. And so I think I can do it. Uh, with with lots of Advil. You can do anything. Oh, no, I don't. I don't take painkillers. I, I figure I, I, I got to get over it by myself. Oh gosh. The way I feel. I've got a, I've got a map here, in, in my house. I'm, I'm sitting looking at it. Has stuff in it. it. Has little flags for round the world trips, and it has just pins for the other trips. So, I've done, I've done pretty well to see most everything there is to see. The last place I went was South Africa, and that, when I had cancer five years ago, and when I got over the cancer, good friends of mine here said, "Where do you want to go now that you're oh, you have licked the cancer?" I said South Africa because I always wanted to go in the Oh my there. gosh, you're unstoppable! And so they said, "Fine, we'll go." So I was through cancer in August and in September we went to South Africa. To, to the, I've been to North Africa three times, but I hadn't been to Cape Town, and so I really wanted to go. Okay. A friend once who had, had multiple uh, companies all around the world asked him where the prettiest place was that he remember. He said Cape Town. Wow. All right, we're going to run out of tape here in just yeah. a minute. So, That's okay. I've um, talked enough. <laughs> thank you very much for sitting You're down welcome. with I us. I hope you find the, those things. I just thought I was trying to be so good to, to thank send you. you the stuff. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. It was very good. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Sure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.